good worship team or what? Man, those guys are so good. Oh, I love it. You guys excited to be in church? Yeah. Or how about this set? Fix me. Thank you. How about this set right here? My gosh. I mean, look at that. Look at that lighthouse and look at that lighthouse. Now, we got some stuff. We get that done on the cheap, too. I mean, we good. Good, good, good. We got some talented people up in here. The name of our new series is Unshakable. How many of y'all need some unshaking right now? Yeah, there's a whole lot of shaking going on right now, isn't there? Crazy, craziness going on out there. Let me just tell you, this series is going to be so good. So not just for you, but if you have any friends, family, anybody that's like struggling, and I know we all know somebody's struggling, some of it is us. We're struggling. Get them in here for this series because, man, this is going to deposit something in you that is just going to make you rock solid. And so I want to start today with a little bit of a kind of a bridge to go back to last weekend. You got these cards when you came in. If you didn't get one, just raise your hand. Guest services will bring it to you. But you'll see that Maslow's motivational model uh, right there at the top. I wanted to bring that back because it really is. It was a great uh, piece for the last installment of... Um, that's not me. Oh, one of our band people left their phone up here. I'm going to go answer it. <laughs> hey, Carrie. Hello. How you doing? Good. Good? Yeah, hey, yeah, Lee's playing bass, but he's not out here right now. I answered on his iPad. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you're good. Oh you're gosh. good. We just started service. You coming? Oh, she hung up. That was awesome. Huh? I didn't have anything like that laughing. <laughs> hey, let me just tell you something. If anybody can appreciate what just happened, Lee Hall appreciates what just happened. He loves you just roll right with it right there. That was so good. Oh my gosh, where was I at? Oh yeah, Maslow. So we got this guy Maslow, right? This motivational model. He was a psychologist and back in the 40s, you know, he's trying to figure out, hey, what is it that motivates people? What causes people to get up in the morning, gets them, gets them to go? And up until the 40s, the very top of this pyramid was actually the second below the top, which is that self-actualization. In other words, they were like, hey, once you hit the pinnacle, once you realize your potential, that is fulfillment. Like once people get there, there's satisfaction, there's fulfillment, life is good. The only problem with that is after they figured that out, they started interviewing these people who did get there. They did hit the pinnacle. They were super successful. They had everything they could possibly want, and yet still they were not fulfilled. There was something on the inside that wasn't fulfilled. On the outside, it looked like they had everything they needed. All their needs were met. They couldn't possibly have or want for need of anything else, but inside they weren't. And we see that, right? How many times do you see people in Hollywood that are making ridiculous money, have houses everywhere, things everywhere, and usually their life ends in tragedy. Or they, they'll search for every crazy thing out there. They start, start this super spiritual journey trying to find something that will fulfill them. By the way, everybody online, good to have you all with us. Hope you all enjoyed the phone conversation with Carrie, Lee's wife. She's awesome and amazing, by the way, and she's mortified. But beyond that, she's good. So this kind of helps because that really is kind of leads into this series that we're doing on unshakable because the only way that you're unshakable is when that transcendent peace is met. And of course, we know the only way to meet that is in God. He's the only one that can fulfill that. He's the only one that can bring a sense of fulfillment so that no matter what is going on in this life, inside you're fulfilled. Whether you have a lot or whether you have little, you have that sense of fulfillment. And so the transcendent piece is answered. And so I want to talk about the role that you and I play in that because what comes out of this is the question everybody asks, which is, why am I here? This is the reason Rick Warren's book, Purpose Driven Life, was the number one bestseller for years. Because everybody wants to know, what is my purpose? Why am I here? And while I can't answer for you individually what your purpose is in life and what God has for you, I can corporately say that for all of us, there is a purpose and a plan for us to partner with God in this world, which is a dark and chaotic world, and it's getting darker and more chaotic as we progress. 
that there is a place and a role that you and I play in partnership with him. And to set that up, I want to read these three passages of Scripture. So we're going to go back to the very beginning and look at what is God's nature. When God encounters darkness and chaos, what is in his nature? What is his natural reaction? We find it in the very first three verses of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said what? Let there be light. And there was light. So God's natural response to darkness, to chaos, at that point there's darkness over the entire earth, chaos, just no order, no anything. God says, I'm going to bring light. That's what I do. Now, that light that is in God's nature now passes on to his son, Jesus. And to see that, we're going to go back to the beginning again, but we're going to do it from the New Testament. We're going to go back to where John is talking about Jesus. He calls Jesus the Word because Jesus is the Word made flesh. Jesus is this Word come alive. So John refers to him as the Word. So we go to John chapter 1. And we see what he says about this same light that is in Jesus. He says, in the beginning was the Word. So not only was God there, but Jesus was there. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And through him all things were made. And without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the what? Light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. So now we have God in the very beginning by his nature, by who he is, bringing light into darkness and chaos. And then we have Jesus who has this supernatural life in him, the same as God the Father. And now he brings it and he says, this life that I have, this supernatural life, is the light for all mankind. So then the question is, how does all mankind get that light? We find that out from Jesus himself in Matthew. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, say this with me, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So do you see the progression? You have God in the very beginning stepping into darkness and chaos and bringing light which now drives the darkness out and brings order. And you have Christ who is with God in the very beginning. And Christ comes to planet Earth with this life in him, this supernatural life that contains that same light of God that is for all mankind. And he says, now I'm going to deposit that in you so that you now can become the light of the world. That is all of us. That is all of our mission That is all of our journey. So what does that look like? What does it look like when you and I are the light of the world? You know, a lot of times Jesus would use parables to help people understand kingdom principles. He would say to them, the kingdom of God is like a farmer who went out to plant some seeds. And he would talk about how that went. Or he might say, the kingdom of God is like a man who went out into his vineyard to prune the grapevines. So he used a lot of agricultural Um, connections with them because they were an agricultural society. So he would say, let me show you something that you're very familiar with, that you see in the natural, and explain to you how the kingdom of God is just like that. So I thought this morning, we're not so much an agricultural society, but we do got some nautical going on, right? I mean, we got some nautical going on. Look at that. I mean, we got us a lighthouse on the stage. We got fishnets. We got anchors. We, we know about the nautical. We know about the lighthouse. Some of the most iconic pictures from the low country have lighthouses in them. So I thought, let's use, let's take that concept of a lighthouse. And I looked up some different things that lighthouses do in the natural and the purpose that they serve. And I thought, oh, my gosh, man, the parallels to us being the light of the world is incredible. Because I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but if you're way out in the ocean, like you're way, way out in the middle of the ocean, so you're, there's no natural light, no city light. I say natural, no man-made light, so no city lights, no anything anywhere. So all you have is a natural light. And it happens if it happens to be a night when there's no moon, so the moon is not out, and it's cloudy so that the clouds block the stars, it is pitch black. I mean, you can't see anything. You can't see your hand in front of your face. If you've ever been out there and and they turn everything dark, then you literally can't even see your own hand in front of your face. And so when you're in a position like that, you don't know which way is up. You don't know where left is, where right is. You don't know where the land is. You don't know where the sky is. You can feel that things are moving, but it feels very unsettling because you don't have a reference point. 
Well, what a lighthouse does is a light brings light. The lighthouse brings light into that darkness. And that light serves a lot of different purposes in helping people navigate the ocean. So I want to walk through three things that a lighthouse does that directly parallels what we do when we allow this life and this light that is in us to shine in the darkness. So I'm going to kind of use three different stations just to kind of help me because I'm just visual. So I'm going to come over here for the first point, which is on your card, and that is that the light of the world in us shines like a lighthouse. It's like a symbol of awareness and being that orients people to their surroundings to ensure safe passage through unknown and rough waters. In other words, this is like the dot on the map, the you are here. Like until you know where you are and what's around you and your surroundings, you can't make sense of anything. You don't know what's up. You don't know what's down. You don't know what's good. You don't know what's bad. And for you and I, we know that in this Word of God, in the Bible, is our complete whole story beginning to end. And so when we know this, we do know what's going on. We know who the good guys are. We know who the bad guys are. We know why bad things happen. We know that God does not cause bad things to happen to good people. He can't do bad. He doesn't do bad. We know all of this because we know His Word. And so this becomes for us something that we can help people orient themselves. When they see that we're not shaken and moved by the sudden shifts in the political venue or the financial venue or whatever it might be, then they realize there's something different. And the difference is we're not shaken by that stuff because we have the whole picture right here. Paul did an excellent example when he was in Greece. So Paul was in Greece. He's going around, he's starting all these churches. He goes to the church in Greece, he's in Athens. And at that time, Athens was the thinking center of the world. Literally, all the upper echelon men did was they sat around in the square and just talked philosophy. And not just their philosophy, any philosophy. They had just a hunger and a thirst to know about any kind of religion, any kind of philosophy, any kind of thinking that was happening anywhere in the world. They really saw it as their mission to like get their arms and their hands around all these different things. And so Paul is in there and he's speaking in the church and one of these guys hears him speaking in the church and they're like, man, this guy, like he's got something there. Like that, that what he's saying like, I think we need to know about this. So he goes and invites Paul. He says, I need you to come to our center here where we do all of our thinking and talking and philosophizing. You need to share this with the men of Athens. So brilliant by Paul, right? Because when Paul came to Athens, the first thing he noticed, idols everywhere. I mean everywhere. The most pagan culture, that any kind of idol or God that there was at that time, they had them set up all over the place because they wanted to cover all the bases. And they did cover all the bases. They had every base covered except the base. And they even had an idol to that. The idol read to the unknown God. So Paul, Paul didn't bust up in there and say, man, you people are stupid. Y'all following all them other religions that aren't going to get you anywhere. There's only one religion. He, he didn't do that. He masterfully goes in there to the church. He's sharing the gospel with people. People start talking. And how, how, y'all know when people start talking, people start paying attention. Somebody comes in. They invite him to come into where all these men are. And I love the way he so respectfully handles the situation. So this is what he says to them in Acts chapter 18. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines. And one of your altars had this inscription on it. To an unknown God. This God, whom you worship without even knowing, is the one I'm telling you about. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since He is the Lord of heaven and earth, He doesn't live in man-made temples. And human hands can't serve His needs, for He has no needs. He Himself gives life and breath to everything, and He satisfies every, every need. From one man He created all the nations throughout the whole earth. He decided beforehand when they should rise and fall, and He determined their boundaries. His purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him, even though He is not far from any one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being. So in that short little passage, Paul just oriented them to what's going on. 
He said, there, all of these things you have set up, those aren't, any God that you have to go and, and take care of their needs is not a God. He said, this God, the God I serve, the God of the creator of the universe of all mankind has no needs. And he doesn't need you to serve him. You can't, serve, you can't meet his needs. But he has a purpose and a plan for you. And I just love how he even masterfully uses their curiosity because they did have that curiosity. He's, the very nature that is in you that is causing you to seek out all these things, God put that there. And the reason he put it there was to bring us to this day when you would find him. And don't get him wrong. He didn't put that nature in you and then go stand way far off and hope that you would find him. He's been right next to you the whole time, the whole time, waiting for this day right here. And now that day has come. I thought that it was so brilliant of the way that he handled that. He was in an absolutely pagan culture worshiping everything under the sun. And he so respectfully handled their heart and even their desire to know something supernatural in a way that did not violate them or offend them and kept them open to hear the gospel of who God really is. That is amazing. The second thing, the second thing that a lighthouse does is it is a symbol of strength and resilience that withstands the powerful storms and turbulent waters. You ever notice that when we build lighthouses, we put them where the storm is coming. You don't ever build a lighthouse and try to put it somewhere where it's in shelter or maybe it won't get too much. No, man, you build that sucker to go right where the hurricane's coming on shore. That's what you want. That's what you build it for. You know the storm is coming. You know the waves are going to come, so you're going to put it right smack in the middle of the storm. And in the same way that a lighthouse is put there for a purpose, for a reason, to light the way, you and I are the same way. We're in the middle of the storm. We all go through the same storms. Nobody escapes the storms. The storms are the common denominator. We are all going to go through the storm of losing a loved one, more than one loved one. And that's, that's the worst to go through, but we are all going to go through it. Nobody escapes that. We're all going to go through financial storms. We're all going to go through physical. We're all going through the storms. The storms... Do not change no matter if you're a believer or a non-believer. What changes is how does the believer stand in the face of that storm when it comes? And Jesus gives us some great examples. I love these verses. The first one is John 16. And Jesus has literally just told the disciples everything that's about to happen in the crucifixion. He told them that because he's telling them basically the storm of your life is coming. Because you have so much hope and faith in me and you have this idea and this belief of who I am and yet you're about to watch me die. So all your hopes and dreams are about to be nailed to a cross and it is going to rock you to the core of your being. But he tells them that in advance and this is why. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble but take heart, I have overcome the world. And just like so many of us, even though Jesus told them ahead of time, even though Jesus prepared them, even though he told them exactly what was going to happen, they still were shaken. What they do? Crucifixion, they run and hid. And a lot of us do the same thing. It's not an accusation. It's just, it's just, it's just our human nature. What about this verse in Matthew? Compared to a lighthouse, I love this one. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the what? Rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. Nobody builds a lighthouse on the sand. I mean, you see the lighthouse, you look like, oh, it's on the sand. It's not on the sand. You know that. You dig down through the sand. You get to the rock. You can't build it on the sand. First big storm is going to be gone. That sand can rise. It can fall. It can erode. It can blow this way and that way. The rock does not move. And so Jesus said, there's a way that when you have my life and my light in you, that when that storm comes and it beats against your house, it won't move you. Doesn't mean it's not going to be hard. Doesn't mean it's not going to be difficult. But it will not move you if you stay firm on the foundation of the rock, which is the truth of this word. David said it this way in Psalms. He said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? There's no reason for me to be afraid. There's no reason for me to fear. God is my rock. And then I love this one, James. Anybody got one of those friends that when you're trying to, you know, pour your heart out to them and you need some sympathy, they just tell you to suck it up? That would be James. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, 
whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. In other words, suck it up. Quit your whining. James is the guy that you don't send to the hospital, right? Because, you know, somebody in the church gets in a car accident, you send James, they go in there, their face is all busted up, and James goes, you wearing a seatbelt? Because if you weren't, that's just stupid. And you deserve every fracture you have in your face right now. Suck it up. So you don't send James to the hospital. You, you send somebody to the hospital that is loving and kind and has mercy, somebody that has like a nurse's heart. You know, I happen to be married to a nurse, by the way. My wife is a nurse, has been for over three decades. And we literally went through one of these situations just this week. So my wife works part-time, and she job shares with another RN. They're both RNs. They occupy one position. And they're very good friends. They work exactly the same. They think exactly the same. So they can care for patients, and wherever one picks off, uh, stops off, the other one can pick up because they're almost exactly like the same person. And uh, the medical field is changing, and not for the better. And, uh, and it's been getting bad, and it's been getting bad. And, and both my wife and this other nurse, their entire career, both of them have over three decades in nursing. Neither one of them have ever gotten below exemplary ratings on their evaluations, their job evaluations. But about, I don't know, four or five months ago, the, a new supervisor was placed over them in this program that, that they're doing. And this supervisor is a storm. When she comes, she is a storm. She comes with just with chaos and darkness and just everything. You get four or five emails, effective immediately. We all need to do this. And so you're trying to be calm and take care of people, and you got somebody who says, ah! And, and that's the person that is above you. So it's very unsettling, you know, and, and then it doesn't take too long to realize, oh, there's an agenda behind this. Because my wife and this other nurse literally started this program at this particular hospital where they take care of people that have chronic conditions. The goal of the program is you call them on a monthly basis, you find out what's going on, and you head a lot of things off and take care of a lot of stuff to take the load off the doctors because the doctors are slammed. The medical field is not going bad because of doctors or nurses. It's the money. And so this program took off. The doctors love it. The nurses love it. My wife love it. Her friends love it because we're taking care of people. You know, these are mostly elderly people that have a lot of trouble. And for them, getting to the doctor or making it, all that is very hard. So if you can head that off in advance and go ahead and take care of it, why not do that? But when the money people come in and they go, how much do we pay our ends? What if we got just some barely minimal, minimal you know, degreed or whatever that can just... Check the box and say, yes, we called. Yes, they have those needs. Here's the difference. When that person calls, they identify, yes, there are five needs that the doctor needs to take care of. Here they are. Nobody's any better. When the RN calls, it's, yes, here's the five needs they have. We'll take care of three. The doctor's going to have to do these two. They appreciate it. The doctors appreciate it. Everybody's happy. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> it's getting bad is the point of that. And, and so last week not this past week, the week before, the other person had their job evaluation. And, uh, and Storm Lady came in and just went for the jugular, just immediately tried to give her subpar ratings on every, every arena that she worked in. And what should have been a 45-minute to one-hour evaluation process was a three-hour three knockdown drag out um, to where she did get her to raise some of them. But it was just, when they got done, she was like, I can't work the rest of the day. You've got me so spun up and just emotionally, I'm just, I'm spent. I don't have anything else to give. So we know that's what's coming. And we know it's going to happen Wednesday. My wife finds out it's going to happen Wednesday. So I come in to prayer, and we have prayer. And uh, I, prayer is over, and I'm driving home, and the Lord just decided to ride home with me. And, you know, sometimes I forget that I married his daughter. You know, it's just, I did, you know, I married his daughter. I didn't think about that. And, you know, I guess his daughter's been talking to him and telling him, you know, this job is really wearing on me. It's pretty much sucking the life out of me. It used to give me life. Now it's sucking everything out of me. And she, sh she has shared that with me. She shared with me, I might want to do something else. And I said, well, you know, let's look at this practically. You know, let's take a look at the budget. Let's see what we need to do. Let's see what we can afford. Maybe we can find something else. In the back of my head, I'm thinking that's 50% of our income. <laughs> let's not move too fast. Let's not make a rash decision. So the Lord gets in the truck with me on the way home. He goes, uh, so, you know, my daughter was telling me that uh, this job, man, it's just really a sucking the life out of her. I was like, yeah, yeah, she told me that too. 
Yeah, so, so your response was, let's look at the budget? Well, you know, um, you know, being a good steward of the finances as the head of the house, you know, I felt that that was a responsible thing to do as, as a good godly husband. Go, oh, really? Yeah, so it's sucking a life out of her, so you want to look at what would be a good practical thing to do. <sighs> Gum it. Yeah. hate when he has those conversations. So I called my wife on the way home, and I said, babe, first of all, forgive me. I'm so sorry. You've been pouring your heart out, and the last thing I want you to think is I'm more concerned about our flipping budget than about you and your heart. So, A, forgive me. I'm so sorry. So she starts crying. I start crying. And I said, and if you, when that, when that lady conference is in, if you want to just go ahead and tell her, you know what? Hey, don't even worry because it's my two weeks right here. Two weeks notice, boom, don't even do the evaluation. I'm out. I said, you feel free. You just go ahead and tell her that. And, of course, she's like, no, 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 I'm not going to do that because she's just good. She's just good like that. So I get home. I'm like, okay, let's, uh, now that we're there, now that I realize I'm a jerk and I've handled all that and I'm, I'm back where I need to be as your husband, let me, let me do what I need to do. Let me lay hands on you and pray for you. I'm very visual. So I lay hands on her. I'm praying for her. And because I'm so visual, immediately God gives me this picture of Jesus walking in the storm. You know, if you're not familiar with that story, the disciples were out on a boat on the Sea of Galilee. They're very familiar with that sea. They've been through plenty of storms, but this storm, there was just something evil about it. And when it happened, they were terrified. And in the middle of that terrifying storm, Jesus just comes chalantly, nonchalantly, just cruising right on up, walking on the water. Just picture of calm and peace. And then he says to the storm, peace be still, and it stops. So I had that picture. What an awesome prayer, right? Awesome word from God. So we got finished. I like, baby, you think, oh, yeah, I feel good. I feel the peace. I, yeah, I do too. I, the peace of God, it's just on me. I feel good. I'm solid. I feel good. So I called Dave and Luke, the other pastors here, and I said, hey, I'm not going to be able to come in this morning. I need a couple of hours. To, I need to be here with Susan when this is all going down because the storm is coming. Crazy ladies coming into my house through that computer, and I need to be here. So I go take a shower. Peace of God. Man, I'm just sitting there. Peace of God. Lord, you're so good. You got us. You got us covered. And I come out, and it's already started. The review's already started. I sit down in the chair. God, you're so good. About five minutes into that conversation, I jump up. I'm going to shut this sucker down right now. <laughs> I walk over there, and I'm going to tell her. I'm going to say, you, what? you can take this right now and just shove it because she, and my wife's <laughs> stops me. Video's turned off, which is a good thing. So at this point, Susan is Jesus walking on the water. In the middle of the chaos, in the storm, walking on. I'm Peter. I was walking on the water. But the moment I heard how she was attacking my wife, I may, now I didn't do this, but I may have in my mind imagined using the center digit on my hand in a vertical position. <laughs> I might have imagined that. And I might have imagined a few choice words coming out of my mouth. But they're only imaginations. And when my wife did this, I backed off. So I went and I sat down and I started texting her. I said, Susan's a rock star, man. I said, because this lady flat out was lying on the evaluation. She flat out had stuff written down that were lies. And my wife, one thing about my wife, a good nurse documents everything. She had it all documented. So this lady would say, well, I'm giving you a one here. If you don't know what a one is, a one is I'm going to clock in, go take a nap in the closet, and I'm going to clock out. It's as bad as you can get. And so my wife would say, and I know it was getting her. God bless her heart. She's like, no, 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 no. Um, I need you to explain to me why I have, you know, you said this is this. You, well, th here's the thing. Well, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into it. There's other No, 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 no. I don't want to know about the other factors. I want to address what you wrote here because that's not true. Here's what happened. We got the whole thing recorded. I'm sitting, I'm like, she is a rock star, man. She is rock. I said, I'm sinking. I'm Peter. I'm, I'm already down at the bottom of the ocean. But she's rocking it, man. <laughs> she is just flat out rocking it. But here's the big takeaway, okay? This is my point to this whole thing of, of the strength and the resilience. Because it wore her out, okay? Don't, I say she's a rock star, and she is, but it flat wore her out. But at the end, you're not moved off of that rock of the fact that, that, that your life does not depend on your job security. Because what we found out through the whole process, this isn't just a hatchet person. It's not, this isn't a supervisor seeking to help you get, if somebody's been called in to say, get rid of them. Whatever you have to do, you do whatever you have to do to get rid of them and just don't make it look suspicious. So now you're on the other side of that, so you know that. You're very much aware of that. Where Susan and I are is, we're good. We're solid, whatever happens, because that place does not provide for us. God provides for us. You know, that, that is not where our help comes from, right? Now, this other person, God bless her heart, I love her to death, but she is scared to death. 
And, and the crazy thing is she doesn't need the job. She's better off financially than we are. If she lost her job tomorrow, her and her husband are fine. I mean, they're set, but yet there is this fear in her that they're coming to get me, that they're going to take my job. And, and, you can, and that is the difference. That is the difference between being on that rock of knowing who provides you and takes care of you and leads you and being on the sand where you, you don't have that strength if somebody is there and they've got you and you can feel yourself sinking. And even if it doesn't make sense logically, you still have that sense of fear and anxiety and there's a spirit behind that. And that spirit that does this cannot stand up to the rock of the truth of the Word of God. So I share that story with you for a couple of reasons. One, to show you we're not all perfect, right? I mean, up and down, talk about up and down. I'm handling it wrong. I correct it on the drive home. I pray, I'm solid, I'm good. Five minutes later, I'm sinking to the bottom of the ocean. You know, that's just part of the journey. But the goal through the whole thing is just to try to keep your eyes where it needs to be. And when you're married and you have a spouse, hopefully one of you is keeping your head, which she did. And, you know, we got on the other side of that, and she's just a rock star, man. Just a rock star of faith. Because, now, she had some fear and anxiety early on, too. But the thing about my wife is... She's got a high level of mercy as a nurse. But once you cross a line and you start violating people, which is what they've now done, what, the way she sees this isn't a violation towards her. It's a violation to the patients that she loves. Because they're not patients now, they're numbers. And they're numbers to be gotten through as quickly as possible. There's no care involved. And when you do that, you cross that line, my girl is a pit bull. And you, got no, you get no mercy. There is no mercy. Don't be looking at her for no mercy. I was going to be part of your salvation. You've got to go find somebody else now. Somebody's going to share Jesus with you. Because I'm about to get the devil all over you right now. But that is, that is that strength and that resilience. That is the difference. Okay, last one. Let me find my notes again. Didn't I have a set of notes? Oh, there they are. All right. Last one. And this is the biggie. Number three is that... Just like the lighthouse, we are a symbol of hope and security that helps people navigate hazardous conditions to gain safe entry into harbors. Again, think about the boat. I always think deadliest catch. We love watching deadliest catch. Those guys fish in hurricanes. Most people, when a hurricane's coming, you go back in. They don't. They fish through it. Like 20, 25-foot waves, they're just out there fishing, hanging out, you know. But a normal person in a normal boat gets caught in a storm and they're booking it back in, trying to get back to the harbor where it's safe and sound. Imagine how you feel when you're in just a pitch black dark night and the first time you see that little twinkling of a light in the distance and you know when I get there, I'm safe. That's where the harbor is. And once I get in the harbor, I'm good. I'm secure. I'm going to be fine. The waves can't get to me there. The wind can't get to me there. I'm in that safe harbor. That's what you and I are called to do. It's called salvation. And I want to read you a few scriptures about salvation. The first one, this is what Paul said about it. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. So it is the power of God supernaturally that brings salvation. And then Jesus said this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus didn't come into this world to save the world. Jesus came into a condemned world to save us from it. The world is already condemned, is condemned. And the whole purpose for him coming is to rescue us from this condemned world. Because at the end of the day, the stuff that happens here is nothing. It is a wisp of smoke. You ever have a candle burning and you like squeeze out the flame, you got that little wisp? In the grand scheme of things, our experiences in this life are that wisp of smoke. When you get that and when you understand that, when you have a clear picture of what is waiting for you for all eternity, man, you're not moved, you're not shaken. My good friend Bobby Brunson sitting back over here in the back of the section. My man got struck by lightning, was dead for 23 minutes, went to heaven and came back. Ask me if anything moves him. Nothing. He got depressed when he came back because he came back. I mean, imagine that. Imagine going and being in the presence of God, of being in heaven itself where everything is perfect. You are whole. There is nothing lacking. No more pain. No more sorrow. And then you get the good news. We're sending you back. It was. It was a real struggle. They've got, they've got a book, when, light, when Lightning Strikes, One Man's Journey to Heaven and Back. Great book, by the way, for you to get, to see the difference in the perspective of how he sees things, having seen where we're all going. That is the end goal. 
and salvation, which is the easiest, easiest thing in the world. One more verse. John says, I mean, uh, Jesus says this in John, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. You know who's done the most damage to the gospel? The church. The people I see struggle the most with their salvation are people that come out of these religious churches that try to convince you that your salvation is hanging on a thread. You got it right now, but you could lose it at any minute. I mean, I know God's all powerful and I know Christ went to the cross, but boy, if you mess up one more time, that's it. You're out. That is not salvation. This is, this is what the gospel is. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Period. In the conversation. Now, I get that there's works. I get that we ought to be doing good and helping people, and there are deeds and all this stuff, and there are rewards in heaven. I get all that. But the, the end day, the biggest question, the biggest thing that needs to be settled and solved, salvation, that is it. I'll never forget, I had a small group a couple of years ago. It's still going. Somebody else is leading it. Um, but my man Jim was in there. And we're having our very first small group. It was about three years ago. Three years ago? Three years ago? Three years Three years ago, and, and Jim was new to Cathedral. Uh, God bless his heart. His, his wife had recently passed away, and she had gotten to come. He was here, and uh, so he comes to the group. And we do what I always do, the very first group of the semester. We go around, you know, tell us who you are, how long you've been coming, a little bit about yourself, da 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 So Jim was last. So we get to Jim. Jim, hey, this is who I am. This is how long I've been coming. Now, I'm not saved like you people, but I like Cathedral. You know, I, I enjoy coming and the music and all that. So, of course, immediately I'm very intrigued by that. Got my eyes on him. So we have our whole group. And I've listened to him in a whole group. And I'm like, we got done. I was like, Jim, like, do you believe that Jesus was the son of God? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, do you believe that he died on the cross for your sins? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I do believe that. Uh-huh. So by chance, do you believe that he rose from the dead like God resurrected him and he's alive today? Oh, yeah, Absolutely. So, could we just go ahead and pray and make it official? Because you've already met all the requirements. So, can we just pray right now with the group and we'll get you saved? <laughs> He's like, yeah, sure, why not? So, I, I love it because he's such a dear friend. And so many times he'll, he'll you know, on his anniversary, his salvation, he'll say, I owe everything to you. You saved my life. And I'll say, I didn't do anything. You were already there. You just needed somebody to point it out, you know? But that is, that is how easy it is. Your salvation should never be... If you find yourself doubting your salvation and you believe those things, then there is something in your mind that is standing... It is a stronghold that is standing up to the truth of what God's Word says. Because God's Word says that is the requirement for salvation. Period. Period. I want to... Um, Okay, let me, let, me, let me orient myself. We did things a little bit different last service. And I don't want to get my order. Let's see, we're doing it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, talking about, talking about salvation. So um, we have Pastor Bob Wyatt is doing our prayer mornings right now. The last, he's doing a series. The last one is this Wednesday. And this past Wednesday, the same Wednesday that God rode home with me in the truck, he was uh, given a little piece of his testimony, and he shared something. I thought, oh, my gosh, that is, so, that is so awesome of the way that God works. So take a look at this little piece of his testimony from Wednesday. When I was 18 years old, I accepted the Lord and walked forward in the church and was baptized. And, uh, and so I always said, you know, I was, it was, I was 17, but almost 18. And so I always, that, that's when I got saved. Except one day I was cleaning out my mom's attic. Going through stuff, my mom, she didn't throw much away. <laughs> and I found something. When I was in the fifth grade, fifth or sixth grade, I'm not sure. They, this is how, how old I am. They used to pass out these in the school. When you got to a certain grade level, I think it was six, five or sixth grade, the Gideons came and they gave every student a New Testament. 
And so this is my New Testament that was given to me when I was 11 years old. And so I found it. I thought, wow. I opened it up. In fact, in the front it says, it's presented to me on January 22nd, 1951. And I was 11 years old. And I, as I looked through it, I flipped over to the back. And lo and behold, on the back is a confession of faith. Signed by me. On August the 27th, 1954. Well, I'll tell you what, I was 14 when I accepted the Lord. <laughs> yeah. I love that. And, and when he shared that, it reminded me of a part of my story. And up until about 14 years ago, if you would have asked me when I got saved, I've always told people I was 25 years old when I got saved. If you've ever been to Growth Track, you've seen the testimony. You probably have heard it in here before. But I had a very miraculous salvation when I was 25 years old. I wasn't in the church when I got saved. I was working at the shipyard. And, and God just arranged a set of situations, circumstances. There's no way you can doubt that there is a God when you hear that salvation story. It's not any credit to me. It's a credit to God and how he pursues us. But that was what I always told me. I got saved when I was 25 until about 14 years ago, 2008. And I was at that time working in the children's ministry. I was children's ministry director. And we were preparing for VBS. So I'm at home and I'm going through the lessons plans and I'm preparing, you know, how are we going to present the gospel for the children and, and what's going to be happening every night. And then all of a sudden, just like Bob finding that Bible in the attic, God just reminded me of something that I had completely forgotten about my entire life. And I remembered and it just came, it didn't come back in little pieces. It was just boom, it was there. And I remembered it like it was yesterday. And I remembered it when I was seven years old. My neighbors, who didn't go to church, by the way, we didn't go to church. Nobody on my street went to church. There were no Bibles in anybody's houses. And yet my neighbor, I think maybe because their daughters who were teenagers at the time, somehow had got recruited to work for the military chapel VBS that was happening on Min Riv in the base of Goose Creek. And so when I was seven years old, they came and asked my parents if they could take me one night to VBS. And I went. And I vividly remember the school desk I was sitting in, this little wooden school desk. And I'm sitting in that desk and I had this popsicle stick cross in my hand and a paper Jesus was pasted to it. And this little old lady was in the front of the room with a flannel graph. And, and I remember exactly what she looked like because she looked just like Miss Seeley, Pastor Mike's mother. Looked just like her, sweet as she could be. And she's explaining the gospel. And man, did I need some kind of light in my life at seven. I just, I just needed some kind of hope. And I remember listening to her and she explained the gospel. And she said, if you want Jesus to come into your heart, if you believe in him, pray this prayer with me. And I prayed that prayer. And as I was remembering that memory, God spoke to me and said, Eddie, I've had you since then. You were mine then. So here's what I believe. Here's what I believe, and I don't care what any religious, ah, oh, this is what I believe. Seven years old, I've got another decade of life that's about to happen. It's going to be very destructive by my own choices, including trying to end my own life that I wouldn't succeed in. And God loved me. So I thought he loved me when I was 25. I thought he worked miracles that day when I was 25 years old to arrange all these things just so, so that I would get saved. This is the bigger miracle. This, is, this little boy, this insignificant little boy that's nowhere near any church person or any church at all has no hope. God said, man, I got to go get my hands on him. Because the moment he puts his faith and trust in me, he belongs to me and I seal him. And I don't care what happens after that here. He belongs to me. So this is what I know. If I would have succeeded in that attempt, if I would have died, I don't know, the hundreds of times that I was driving drunk, I would have been shocked when I breathed my last breath here to open up my eyes in heaven. I would have been saying, God, why am I here? How did this even happen? And he would have said, let me show you what I did when you were seven years old. 
I just, I just put you on the heart of these two sweet girls that live next to you, and, and, and they brought you to VBS. Because I know you, Eddie. I know your heart. I knew if you could just hear how much I loved you. It doesn't matter how unloved you felt in that moment. Right then, you would know that I loved you, and I knew that you would give your heart to me. I would have been blown away. And I still am because that's the God that we serve. My belief is that you have to work really, really, really hard to not get saved. So if you've ever given your life to Christ, if you've ever prayed that prayer of faith, don't don't keep doing it over and over again. That's a done deal. I laugh sometimes because, you know, the children's ministry, when you ask if you want to ask Jesus in your heart, they, they raise a hand every week, every week raising that hand. Well, some of y'all do the same thing. Get up here, give an altar call. I'm like, oh my gosh, you just raised your hand last week. (laughs) Same thing. Let's settle that thing. Settle that because that needs to be settled. And you need to be firm on the rock with that so that you can be the hope, so that you can be the strength and the resilience, so that your light can shine. The enemy wants you to doubt that because he wants to dim that light in your eyes. God wants you so fully alive with that light that, man, it shoots out of your eyes when you get around people, that they see that life that is on you. That's what God wants for you. So I'm going to ask you if you would just to bow your head and close your eyes. Because I want to read something to you, and I don't want you reading the screen while I'm doing it, so it's not even going to be on the screen. But it comes out of the book of Romans, and it is just an incredible promise to every single one of you. And it's in Romans chapter 8, so I'm going to read it in first person to you. For God knew you in advance, and he chose you to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen you... He called you to come to him. And having called you, he gave you right standing with him. And having given you right standing, he gave you his glory. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for you, who can ever be against you? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for you, won't he also give you everything else? Who is it that dares accuse you whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given you right standing. Who then will condemn you? No one, for Christ Jesus died for you. He was raised to life for you. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for you. Can anything ever separate you from Christ's love? Does it mean that he no longer loves you if you have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? No. Despite all those things, overwhelming victory is yours through Christ who loved you. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate you from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither your fear for today nor your worry about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate you from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate you from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, your Lord. If you would just keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed for a moment, I want to do one more thing. A lot of times we ask people to raise their hands if they want to take that step of faith and ask Christ into their heart, just like Jim did. It's super simple. If you believe Jesus was the Son of God, if you believe he died on the cross for your sins, if you believe he rose from the dead and is alive today, then you simply confess that, and at that moment you're saved. And typically I only ask the people that are doing that for the first time to raise their hands, but this morning I'm going to ask every person in here in just a few minutes, I'm going to ask every person in here who has already made that step of faith to raise their hand. And at the same time, I'm going to ask that anybody who wants to do that for the first time, that you would raise your hand with them. And then we're all going to pray together with our eyes closed and heads bowed, but it's going to be a prayer to just solidify this salvation peace on the inside of all of us. So if you're in here and you're already a believer, or if you're in here and you've never been a believer, would you just raise your hand? If you've if you're never put your faith in Christ and you're ready to do that this morning, just raise your hand with everybody else that's raising their hand in the room, just as an action step of faith. You can put your hands down. 
Eyes closed, heads bowed. Pray this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you first knew me and saw my whole life before I breathed a single breath. You ordered my days. You saw what would be coming. And you made sure I would spend all eternity with you. You pursued me. You came after me. And it's because of you that I have my salvation. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son. That he died on the cross for me. And that you raised him to life to give me life. So, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, forgive me of my sins, and be my Lord and Savior. And from this day forward, I will never doubt and I will never waver that my eternal home is with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give those guys a big round of applause that raise their hands for the first time? <laughs> Whew. That's why we do what we do. Stand with me if you would. Let me just bless you guys. I want to bless you with the awareness that you are this light. You are the light that shines in the darkness. I get that Jesus is the light. He got it from God. He gave it to us. And then he said, you are the light of the world. So you are the light in your workplace. You are the light in your family. You are the light when you're on the phone with those aggravating suckers that have done pass you off to four different people waiting to get to the right one. You're still the light. So hey, the light might dim a little bit. It might flicker. Stay true to God and who he is and who he's called you to be because that light that is in you, he's going to use it. to. And right now, as crazy as it is, he's going to start drawing people in like flies, man, like moths to a flame. I bless you that you are the light of the world. So get out there and let your light shine, dadgummit. Have a great weekend. <laughs>